Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Monin. And I am Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And you're listening to our 2023 PAX East special. And this year for PAX East, unfortunately, only Matt was able to go. I was I had a prior engagement and was unable to make it, but that's fine because Matt's here. I am here. <laughs> hey, Matt, how was PAX East this year? Yes. If you are one of our lucky patrons, you may have heard some of the unedited interviews that I got to conduct while I was there. At the end of this episode, you'll hear the edited ones. But if you want to hear the uncut interviews, you, of course, can join our Patreon. More on that at the end of the episode. But before we get into PAX East 2023, this seemed like a good point because we haven't really recorded since the announcement to talk a little bit about the death of E3, the seeming second death of E3, since Jeff and I, our first E3 was the online one. Yep. Then it died and then it was going to come back this year and then it died again and i'm never going to california for e3 i mean it's just not happening if we go to california for video games it's going to be for jeff's show the other jeff's show not this jeff's show a different but still with a g but still with a g which is nice but yeah you know it's a little bit of a bummer read pop folks who help put on packs which we've gone to quite a few times now especially me was going to put on e3 and work with the esa to make it happen this year they were giving out press badges, they were ramping up for the event, and then slowly companies started to pull out. And then eventually after that, after a bunch of major companies pulled out, they announced that the event wasn't going to happen. And, you know, people have mixed feelings on it. I, as someone who never got to go to the in-person event, am a little bummed because this would have been me and Jeff's first one as we have incredible friends and contacts over at Lovely Stride PR who represent and we're going to get press badges to go. But right. It just ended up not happening. And like that said, of course, E3 is also run by the same company, the ESA, who leaked like over 300 journalists' complete contact information to the internet. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, give and take. It was an industry event. This one was rumored to be more of a fan event and less of an industry event. I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. But when I was at PAX East, I had no idea that this was going to happen. I was, in fact, talking to someone about registering as press and signing up for the event. And then... When I got home days later, they announced the the death of it. And it's just interesting to think that this just won't ever happen again. I mean, who knows? Maybe they'll try again, again. But this seems like this might be the actual nail in the coffin for E3. I think the sort of market and world that E3 serviced doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And I'm not the first to say that. That's hardly any sort of groundbreaking statement. But the fact that Matt, you and I grew up reading news of what was being shown and demoed and found and announced at E3 in gaming magazines, on fledgling gaming sites. Nowadays, major gaming companies are able to host their own direct feeds. And the sort of behind closed doors press event that heralds these sort of announcements has shrinking real estate. Sure. I mean, granted, yes, there is that sort of feather in your cap, the same sort of way that, you know, I really would have liked to have gone to a show at CBGB's. <laughs> but again, if I'd gone in its waning days, would I have really gone? Technically, yes. But this also means that I don't think that this is like the death of conventions or of announcements or anything like that. Far from it. I mean, I was not able to go to PAX East this year, but going last year, I'm looking forward to going to PAX West when it happens. But I do love finding new games when we go to those spaces. I remember going to MAGFest and getting to discover Quartet and the upcoming Little Nemo game. And when those are a little closer to things, I hope to talk about them more because they were utterly fantastic amongst other great titles, as I'm sure you found while you were at PAX East this year. Yeah, totally. And my last thought also on E3 before we talk about PAX East is in the age of Twitch, once they started streaming all of the press events... Mm -hmm. It became less important, and that's when Nintendo started doing their directs, and then other companies slowly followed suit in a similar fashion. And like because you didn't have to have a ticket to see what was happening in A3 anymore, like you mentioned back in the day, like you had to read Game Informer to see what was happening in A3, or read EGM, or look Game online. Pro or any of those. Yeah, go what? to Sega Sages to yeah. look it up. But now... You can watch it on Twitch. Most of the companies host their own directs, and it just it's more accessible to the audience, so there's less need for the industry-specific event. Yeah, it feels a little more like the digital E3 that we went to felt more like being a fancy patron on the games industry's Patreon than yeah. anything else, and that's neither here nor there. That's just simply what it feels like right now, and 
I think that needs to be accounted for in terms of whether or not these events happen. Yeah, I agree. And I think the reason that an event like PAX will continue to thrive, I think, is because Indy has a bigger part of it now than it used to, but also it's always been about this has been an event for fans and the industry and mostly focused on the fans, right? In the same way MAGFest and Dragon Con and all of these other conventions are more about the attendees than the press. The press gets to go and gets whatever special exclusives they get. But mm-hmm. like for the most part, it's designed around the community, not just the media, whereas E3 was always media first. GDC is media first. Yeah, it's the convention rather than a media event. We can right. announce all kinds of things in all kinds of places. We don't need a ballroom for it. No, for sure. But yeah, uh, PAX East was great, as it always is. Endlessly grateful to have a media badge to this event. And to get to go to some panels and be on panels, like it endlessly surprises me, even though I do it almost every year now, is be a speaker on panels. I mean, at last PAX East, we had our own panel. We hosted a panel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, This time I didn't have to do as much work because I got to be on other people's panels instead of hosting them myself. It was a lot of fun. And truthfully, I didn't do much work. Frankie did most of the work, but still was stressful to host our own thing. Putting your name on it versus just rolling up with an iced coffee and opinions. Right, exactly, which I certainly did. And so I guess before we get into the games I played, we can't talk about the panels I did. So I did two panels. I did GameCube is the greatest console ever made, hosted by Jacob McCourt. And it was me, Cam Hawkins, Asa Greenriver, Mike Toundro, and Jenna Garcia. And it was literally talking about why the GameCube was the greatest console ever. Yes, we showed photos from that frame this press event, because of course we did, including uh, Jason Alexander looking like a scared creature (laughs) and then we tried to make the most definitive 15 game list but the twist was we picked the first 10 games and then we let the audience nominate games and vote on a game to replace and the panel would vote whether to accept that change or decline that change so uh, i was unable to watch the panel due to my previous engagement where did cubivore end up on the list didn't make the list sorry bud sacrilege But the good news is for folks like Jeff, if you did not get to see the panel, you can go to Jacob McCourt's YouTube page to watch it, or you can listen to it in the Left Behind Game Club feed. So there are two ways to hear it. We'll include it in the show notes. But it was a great time. I had a blast. I love arguing with Cam Hawkins. He's become a very good friend of mine. Cam is very passionate, and he defended NBA Street Volume 2 to the death. And I, of course, fought to the death and didn't get very far for Beautiful Joe and Wario World. Wario Mm -hmm. World, still one of the best 3D platformers ever made. I will die on that hill. Speaking more seriously, I am always an Eternal Darkness human. Yeah, sure. And that was, of course, mentioned. I don't know if it made the final list. Of course. You can find the final list, I believe, in either the show notes of that episode of the Left Behind Game Club episode or on Twitter. And then I also got to be on the great video game music showdown panel, which was incredible. And it was hosted by Luke Lewis of Lukewarm Games, who's done Mm -hmm, mm quests for us before. And it featured Celia from Yacht Club Games. It featured Alex Van Aken from Game Informer. Cam, again, we were on panels together. It was very funny. And Jacob McCourt. And that one was a lot of fun. It was just fun to fight for the soundtrack. My soundtrack won, which was Chrono Trigger. So we each picked a soundtrack and then sampled a song from the soundtrack to like show why we thought it should be in it. And the final battle was between Shovel Knight, which Celia picked, of course. If you work at Yacht Club, you're going to pick the best game. But the final was Shovel Knight and Chrono Trigger. And I said, I believe during the panel, I've already won because Shovel Knight was my second pick if I didn't pick Chrono Trigger. So I've already won. No matter which one makes it to the finals, I am truly the winner. But Chrono Trigger ended up winning. Unfortunately, that panel is not available. There were issues with the Twitch stream. There might be a uh, VOD that we get later, but it's going to be a while. But keep your eyes on Lukewarm Games anyway, because it's a great podcast. And if it becomes available, it'll be available there. But it was was really fun. And then I got to go to some other panels. Mike Toundro, who we have an interview with later in the show, hosted a video game music vinyl panel with previous guest Jesse Vitelli and the aforementioned Cam Hawkins, who was on too many did panels. Did he get to year. walk the floor at all? A little bit. He also did like other actual work, I Damn, think. Damn, so, man. Yeah. But that panel was great and fed the bad habit we all have of buying soundtracks that we sometimes maybe never even listen to. We just want to have them. I will say that getting a cassette deck has been incredible and I can spend a little less money on some excellent soundtracks. Yeah, actually, cassettes did come up in the panel as well, because there are some cassette collectors. And then the biggest panel I got to go to is I got a press seat for the official Final Fantasy 16 panel with Yoshi P, which was incredible because I was in the same room as the legendary Yoshi P. Yeah, yeah. 
and got to see a lot of like hands on. They actually played Final Fantasy 16. And like I was already excited for this game because it's a new Final Fantasy, but getting to see it in action. It's like Devil May Cry and Final Fantasy had a baby because the action combat system is pretty much straight out of that kind of game. And so I'm Incredible. very excited. Also, the main character has a cute dog companion that you can pet in the game. This is the best evolution in game design, I gotta say. Yeah. The panel was called You Can Pet the Torgle because Torgle is what the dogs are called in this world. Uh, <laughs> and it was just very good. Shout out to the folks at Square Enix PR for getting me into the panel and allowing me to witness it. But it looks very cool. I'm very excited for yeah, this game you. to come out in June. Uh, it might be the first Final Fantasy in a while that I play like the day it comes out. So that's really exciting. Fantastic. Well, very cool. So those are some great panels that you got to see and great ones that you got to be a part of. Were there any highlights out on the floor while you were walking about? I know we've got some fantastic interviews lined up, some of the aforementioned ones for like from Yacht Club. Are there any other games you want to shout out that we didn't get a chance to have interviews for? Sure. So obviously, if you follow us on Twitter and on Facebook, you saw that I awarded our game of show, a thing that we're going to do going forward when we go to shows, because why not? People like winning awards. And it was for Slay the Princess. It's a two-person development team. I did get their information. We do plan on bringing them on this very show at some point. But after playing just the short demo that they had at PAX East and watching several other people, it just was a no-brainer. I had to award it. And the unfortunate part is that I can tell you literally nothing about the game here. Why is that? Because I think this game is best served if you play it knowing nothing going into it. But one of the things we can tell you is the demo that was played at PAX East is available on Steam. So if you want to have that same experience, you can download it and check it out. And as somebody who had that experience of Matt coming back going, Jeff, download this game play it. I will tell you nothing else. I had a wonderful time and I hope you do too. It's a horror game. Yeah. I will tell you that because I feel that's fair. Yeah. And if that sounds great, go for it. Please do. Slay the Princess is a horror thriller and it is a visual novel where you make choices and the choices do matter. They affect the game. Uh, and y'all know how much I love choices. This, this is the kind of game that I could see bringing on Reignite for totally different reasons. This is the April Fool's Day episode of Reignite. Right. But yes, definitely go play it. It was great, and it deserved our award. I mean, honestly, what's fun about doing these events as press is that we get the media emails because we get a ton of emails pitching games and interviews during the lead up. I say yes to the ones that I want to play and that I'm most excited about. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. most of our interviews at the end of the show are the games that I really wanted to play. I will say that Wrestle Story, which is not Wrestle Quest, I had to say that a lot at this event. <laughs> was the new game from the folks who made Bark. And like when I got mm -hmm. the email, it was an unannounced game. Like they said, we're going to announce the new game and do interviews about it. And when I got there, I had walked past Russell's story a bunch of times. When I got back and saw that was what my appointment was for, I got really excited. And for those who haven't looked up Russell's story yet, it differs from WrestleQuest in the sense that not only is it not a pixel art aesthetic, it's more of a cartoony art aesthetic. It also is not featuring actual wrestlers. It's a made up world with made up wrestlers. Very fire pro wrestling kind of thing. But the coolest thing is that you get to create your own wrestler. And they talk more about this in the interview. But the first thing I asked, because you picked a body type, is do you pick your gender? And they said, no, you just pick your body type. You pick what you want to look like. But gender doesn't factor in at all. Now, I don't know if there's pronoun selection. We didn't get into that. But the fact that for body type and look, anybody is any gender made me feel really happy and really good. There's going to be more details on that game in that wonderful interview. But... That was one of my favorite games of show until I got to see Slay the Princess. The reality is there's so many games to see here at these events that it's hard to see them all. And so the ones that I end up seeing are just the ones that I have interviews for, except for the occasional other ones that I check out. Were there any that people were talking about that you didn't get to do an interview for that you're just like, I was hearing a lot about this? Um, so what's funny is that that game was Slay the Princess until I checked it out. But the funniest thing beyond that is that after we awarded a game of show and passed the controller did and a few others, then it just like across the internet, like people were tweeting about this game and it just became ubiquitously the game of show for like almost everyone. It became the water cooler game for a good solid weekend, at least there, definitely. Which was neat to see. I mean, there were some Finji games, nothing new. I think all stuff that's released that I didn't get to check out that I'd wanted to. Like there was a there's a post apocalyptic one that I can't remember that I've been meaning to check out that I just didn't get around to. I mean, here's one that I didn't get to play and that I had wanted to, but I did get to talk to former guest Hunter Bond about it. Mm -hmm. um, Infernax is adding 
by the time you hear this, I believe it'll have been added. It is out. A multiplayer mode for Infernax. Do or die. Which is awesome. Also, I want to thank the folks over at Berserk Games and Hunter Bond for supplying Jeff and I with review codes so we can check out the multiplayer and play it together, which we may do a stream of at some point. But we're definitely going to play regardless. But I didn't get to oh, play yeah. it on the floor. I did get to talk to Hunter about D&D for a little while because, of course, I did. <laughs> but uh, I didn't actually get to play it and go hands on with it. And so I do regret that. Although I did find out because, of course, every time I talk to Hunter, I have to talk about that wall chicken moment. Yeah. He said there's something new with that in multiplayer mode. Like all of the cinematic pixel art, mm -hmm. they're different scenes for multiplayer. They incorporate the second player. So he said for Wall Chicken specifically, there is a new scene that happened. Fantastic. But wouldn't tell me what. So since the beginning in playing Infernax, I've appreciated the level to which they where they pick and choose subverting expectations and having a bit of fun at our expense. So I haven't gotten to that point yet. I'm very excited, though. Yeah, same. I'm sure we'll have a blast with it. I mean, we had a blast with it before, so I don't know why we wouldn't now. Right. I can't imagine that we wouldn't enjoy ourselves. You're here. A little other fun artifact of being at PAX East is before we left, I was rooming with a bunch of folks who have guested on the show before or done side quests like Matthew Fenneman and Scott White. Scott White asked if we were bringing our 3DSs, and I said, of course I am. I need to street pass. And a few folks were like, eh, I'm not going to bring it. But I did. And what was really fun is I forgot to check my 3DS before I got home. So I got home and had street passes from Eric Van Allen and Scott White and Austin and a few other folks who I hung out with at PAX. And then I got to see their me's when I got home, which was kind of <laughs> neat. It's bittersweet because the 3DS is on the way out. But that was a fun moment since this might be the last time we can actually street pass. Unless the street passing will continue to exist even after the store support is done. I'm not sure how that works. I'm not sure myself. All I know is I'm happy I can still play Pokemon Shuffle on my phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, everyone's got what they're worried about here. Yes, for sure. You know, we all have our priorities. Yeah. No, but that also is a very nice encapsulation of the joy of the convention experience. Yeah. Of getting to see old friends, new favorites, getting to take it all in. It's one thing to look through a list of what games are out there. It's even one thing to look at a map of the show floor and point to things and figure things out. One quick anecdote that I would love to talk about. This was my PAX East experience. As somebody who had a press badge and was planning on going before circumstances prevented me from doing so, that I was getting those emails as well and was getting excited about certain games and loved that where our tastes were aligning. But I will not give specifics here, but Matt, you were there for this too. Yes. One of the emails... All of the press emails that go out are blind CCs. Yes. Of course, by necessity, for all sorts of reasons. One, unfortunately, had a bit of a mishap in terms of email communication. It happens. There's a lot of messages. But it did mean that a lot of indie game journalists suddenly had each other's email. And there were a few folks who were upset. And there was a few bits of grumbling. But I want to say that about 95% of the messages that were going on there were people choosing to go, oh, cool. Hi. And it became an introduction thread. And I started just checking out people's websites and who people were. And I started taking notes. And I cannot off the top of my head. I, I wasn't planning on talking about this, but this just brought it back up. And I need to look through it again because it was a wonderful other little piece of the optimistic view of gaming where... People just like to share experiences and share what we love together. It was a very nice turning around of what was ultimately a little bit of a goof and a blunder. Yeah. But we've all made those. Yeah. And you know what? I don't think I've ever had any goof or blunder I've made turned into something so nice and so pretty. Yeah, for sure. Also, to answer your question about a game that I got to play but didn't get to interview anyone for that I forgot to mention and how I could forget it, I don't know is I discovered when I got to PAX East, I never got an email about it. There is a Toxic Crusaders beat-em-up game, which is coming out, I think, later this year, maybe early next year. Incredible. And I got to play it. I got to send friend of the show, Case Aiken, a bunch of stills about it and pictures because, like, he's the biggest Toxic Avenger fan I know. I believe he's spoken about it on his own shows, but Case actually worked yeah. on the Toxic Avenger off-Broadway musical when it was in New York City. He did, yeah. And so I got to play that multiplayer with the aforementioned Matthew Finneman, and it's fun. It's not as in-depth as the Turtles game that I think will spoil us for beat-em-ups, but it <laughs> definitely felt like an old-school arcade beat-em-up, and so 
it was definitely really cool. It'll depend on the price tag, whether it's really worth it. But if it's like ends up being a $15 or $20 indie game, like it's totally worth it for the amount of fun we had playing multiplayer. But how does it compare to the death and return of Superman on the Super Nintendo? Oh, way better. <laughs> way better. High bars. <laughs> High bars, Matt. Yeah. But yeah, but uh, that game was really cool and really fun. I did want to chat with the devs, but I just I never got around to it. I was very overbooked. There's only so much time in it. And unfortunately, it was just you that weekend. It was. Yeah, but it was a fun game to play. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about it when it gets closer to release. I'm lucky that all the people I interviewed and like all the games that I got to play, I enjoyed all of them. There were no games that was like, oh, this wasn't for me. Yeah, yeah. I think the one that I'm most excited about of the interviews we have, I mean, like the interviewing was about Shovel Knight is a no brainer, right? Yeah. But that doesn't count. Mina the Hollower is like the free space on this. Yeah, yeah. But I did get to talk with Junkie, who is the current narrative director for Coffee Talk 2. And I didn't finish Coffee Talk before my press appointment, but I did finish it on vacation last week as of when we're Mm -hmm. recording. And it's an incredible game. It's so much fun. It's so chill. And like there is a narrative and the narrative hook and the ending are great. And of course, I got to play a demo of two and they changed a few things. But for the most part, it's the same cool, chill vibes. I don't know anything about the main narrative of the sequel because you just play a day. Famously, Mm. Coffee Talk takes place over 14 days. I think it's the same amount of days in the sequel, they said, but it's more time. You spend more time in each day because it's, I think, double the length of the original because the original is like four or five hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I loved what I played. There are slight graphical upgrades. Like it's very minor, but like sprites just look prettier and more fleshed out and more detailed. But yeah, it's great. If you like the first one, I think you're going to like the second one. Of course, we did talk about the original creator who passed and like how much that Mm. they just want to live up to his legacy and just create a game that he'd be proud of and that the bones of this game are his game. You know, they're just fleshing out a story that he wanted to tell. And so there's going to be more of that in the interview as well at the end of the episode. But I wanted to talk about it a little bit here because Coffee Talk was a game that Keith from Jukebox Vertigo did a side quest on for us a while back. And I'd wanted to check it out since then. And I had played the demo and I never got around to it. And so then I finally, when I knew I was going to be going to PAX, I was like, I'm going to be on a four hour train ride. I'm going to play this game. And I played most of it. And yeah, I I love it. If you like visual novels, this is a must buy. Then what you're saying about the sequel and what's talked about in the interview is incredibly exciting for what's to come with that. Totally. I did forget to mention a few panels that I went to. I also did go to Video Game Tinder, which was hosted by one Eric Van Allen. Mm -hmm. It's aired on the Normandy FM feed, so you can actually go listen to it there. Ken Shepard was on that panel. Uh, Carly, I can't remember her last name. It's going to kill me. I believe Janet Garcia was on that one as well. I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. It was a really great panel, and I'm sorry for the person on the panel who I've forgotten, but you're awesome. But it was a great (laughs) panel, and literally Eric made Tinder slides for video game characters, including like their favorite song on Spotify. Like Mm. It was just, the attention to detail was incredible. I'd expect nothing less of Eric. And also, let me tell you, as someone who is very open about what he's into, sexually especially uh it was very fun to hear the cheer that bowser got when he showed up i think jack black (laughs) voicing him in the new film helped a little bit either way bringing him in a new audience yeah i wasn't i wasn't alone and that felt nice but they were great it was really fun oh jared john was the other person on the panel i knew i would remember eventually fantastic but it was a great panel. It was loads of fun. Also, Axe of the Blood God did a RPG draft panel, which previous guest of the show, Scott White, was on. He was the host of Blood God, as well as Scott White and Michael Hyam. And that also panel was great. They drafted like different. It was like you do a, any kind of draft, football draft or whatever, except it was for a video game, like the soundtrack, the party, the world. And like you could only pick one game for each option that's on the acts of the blood god podcast feed and that was a lot of fun to be present for because to see what went first and what people picked was actually really interesting yeah Mm -hmm. as you can tell by how scattered my thoughts have been pax east was great it was also like two weeks ago as of when we're recording in my memory it is it was yeah but also it's because it was just kind of a whirlwind of a weekend and i had a blast There's so much more that I don't even know that I'm recalling to talk about. But, uh, oh, I played the Pokemon card game for the first time ever. In all these years, I had never played the game. But I got in early during the press hour and got to go to the Pokemon trading because Pokemon's representation at the con was the trading card game. And so I got to play the game. I got a small starter pack. 
pre-built deck that I can use for different versions of playing the game. And I got an exclusive enamel pin for just that event of uh, Sprigatito, who is my favorite of the new game. So that was really cool. Love me an enamel pin. Got a Zelda Tears of the Kingdom enamel pin as well that was exclusive at this event. I mean, PAX is always all about the enamel pins and the pin trading. So yeah, I, I have my very shiny EV TCG pin from PAX Unplugged. Yep. Similar experience. They also had like a giant Link statue that you could take a photo with, which was pretty neat. I didn't end up doing it because I just wanted the pin, but that was cool. Yeah, there was just a lot to see and do at this event. And West, when I was there, felt a little empty, but mostly filled. But I know when we were at East last mm. year, like you could feel the emptiness. It wasn't super obvious, but the floor definitely wasn't as packed as it normally is. It was less so this year. There was definitely more people and the event space itself felt more full, more stuff to do, more stuff to see, which was great. Very nice. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like it was an absolutely fantastic weekend. And I'm sure when listeners, you hear the interviews after we're done here, you'll hear some of that as well. Yeah. And then I think the only thing before we wrap up on a personal note, I got to encounter some folks that I've been wanting to talk to all weekend, but I didn't want to bug. But when I got back to my hotel, um, I ran into a few YouTubers, including Cat Icarus, who I've run into before, Gilly the Kid, who I've run into before, and of course, the incredible Gerard, the completionist, Khalil. And Gerard was very kind. He looked at me because we've met a few times and went, I know you, right? We've met before. I said, sort of, we've met before, but you meet a thousand people. You don't know me, but we got to chat and a little behind the scenes we are working to get him on the show we'll see he's very busy but we're hoping maybe before the end of the year to get him on and have a chat with him which would be a lot of fun since i've been following his work for a while but it's funny cat icarus also remembered me he's like we've met before haven't we i said yeah i cornered you in an airport and we took a quick selfie he's like you're the reason all my fans think i'm so short i said that's me oh no <laughs> yeah because i towered over him in that photo it was pretty you're, funny you're very tall yeah i am very tall but that was fun. They were all delightful. They were hanging out with some of the Yacht Club folks. I did get to catch up with Ben and Rudis again. We didn't do an interview this year, but we got to chat for a bit, which was nice. Lovely. Um, Lovely. He remembered me. Also, uh, Chris King remembered me from 30XX. Like That was the fun thing also was I've been doing industry adjacent stuff for a little while now, but to go to an event and for so many of the developers and marketing people and press people to remember me and not only remember me, but be excited to see me. That was pretty neat. I really enjoyed that. We are going to have folks nice. like Chris King on at some point to talk more in depth about 30XX and what it's like to develop a giant Mega Man X-like game like that probably later this year. But it was fun to catch up with those folks. There were a ton of really great folks there. And it was a wonderful experience. I hope that you get to come with me to West this year. Me too. And I hope we just get to do more cons this year because it was really fun to be back. And it's really cool to get to talk to these people who are just really passionate about what they do and what they make. Yeah, yeah, no, there's a lot of exciting things that you got to see at PAX East and things that you and I are both excited for in the coming year from gaming. And so, listeners, did any of you go to PAX East? Was there anything you got to check out that you're really excited about or things you even heard about coming out of PAX East that you are looking forward to coming out this year? The big games, the small games, what are you excited about? Please let us know. There's so many ways to reach out to us. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Fun and Games Pod. You can email us at funandgamespod at gmail.com. Let us know what you think of this episode, previous episodes, who you'd like to see or what you'd like us to talk about in future episodes. You can also go to certainpov.com and find not only a permanent invite link to our Discord server where we continue these conversations, but also finding links to all sorts of other fantastic certain POV shows. You can also visit our Patreon, support us there at patreon.com, uh, fun and games pod. And you might even be able to, if you'd like, and if you have the means and wish to join those up on the high scoreboard, including Alex Lavelle, Case Aiken, Daniel Needen, film it yourself, Patrick Edwards, Rob Bacon Golem Tremarco, Robert Proyne, and Sean Bowen. Please enter your initials. The show floor does close in 15 minutes, however, and I'm going to announce that every three minutes or so. Just get used to it. Please clear the floor, but enter your initials. Thank you very much. True to life experience, Jeff, is not right? exaggerating. Also, if you're listening and I forgot to mention your panel or your cool thing that we did or the cool person I saw, I'm sorry. Please shout me out and shame me in the comments or on social media. You can find me at DJ underscore Storm again. You can find Jeff at Jeff Makes Noise both on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm excited for the future of not only Fun and Games, but our interaction with conventions. Also, I will say, because I didn't say at any point, 
the show floor was 100% masked. Panels were 100% masked. That said, there were the odd asshole who decided not to wear a mask anyway, but uh, enforcers enforced wearing masks. Everyone pretty much wore masks, and that was really a relief. And so I don't know how readily I would have gone to a convention if there wasn't masking. That said, I didn't get COVID when I got back, but I still got con crud because I had a sore throat for like three days. So, you know, we can't escape all of it. Two panels. This is what happens. <laughs> right. Yes, it was the talking. Exactly. But thank you for joining us on this. We love doing this kind of coverage and we will continue to do it. If you got to hear our unedited interviews, thank you for joining at that level of the Patreon. Everything will be in the show notes as well. The panel I was on that you can listen to now, our Patreon and all of that other stuff, where to rate and review us, our Discord, all of those fun things. And before Jeff signs us off, I just want to say thank you one more time to Read Pop and to Stride PR for sending me as media. I hope you enjoyed these interviews. It was a blast chatting with all of these folks. And we will include their info, of course, in the show notes as well. But we should get out of here so folks can hear some interviews. Exactly. So you can see those conversations that happen on the show floor and that you can be part of the conversation that is this show. Thank you for being a part of that conversation. I'm Jeff Moonen. I'm Matty K. Storm again. And happy gaming. I'm here at PAX East, and I'm with Waz from Yacht Club Games. Waz, thanks for chatting with me. Yeah, absolutely. So I just played the latest demo of Mina. I'm very excited. In this demo, you introduced some different weapon varieties. Talk a little bit about the new weapons that we're getting to play in this demo here. Yeah, that's so... The original game, we showed off one of the weapons. That's like sort of the Inception, you know, incorporating Castlevania into... Uh, Bloodborne slash Link's Awakening, and so the whip is there. We brought that back. The whip is called the Night Star. We also introduced two new weapons. So one's a much faster, a dual blade setup. So <laughs> Whisper and Vesper, I think. They're really fast. You're getting a lot of combos out. You're getting really close to enemies, though, so it's a little scarier. But to kind of mitigate that, you can, you can throw one of the blades. And once you throw it, it kind of like it exists in real space. You have, to, like, you have to go get it because then you can like, only stab at half the speed because you only have one of the weapons. We're also like thinking about other ways to make them more interesting. The other weapon is the Blast Strike Maul, which is a big hammer. With that, you can do a little quick melee attack and then combo that into a big swing. And if you charge the swing even harder, it like, lights on fire. And then you, when you smack it down, a huge explosion erupts and you like you eject a, like a shell. Like it's, like it's a gun thing. Amazing. It also gives you a roll when you're charging. And so like the mobility changes drastically. Every weapon is sort of like a new build of Mina. You can almost, almost think of it like a like a monster hunter weapon or a bloodborne weapon, where like the gameplay is totally different. And doing a run with the blast strike mall is going to feel way different than with a night star. That's amazing. And so Mina is well under production. You guys don't have a release date yet, but it sounds like you guys are making some great progress, adding some really cool stuff. Can you talk about any of the new stuff that you've started to add to the game, or maybe some of the new stuff that we can look forward to? in the final release? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we wanted to show off is the Carving Man. He's like one of the, the more scary guys that shows up throughout the level. The area is called September. And as you progress through September, you're ambushed by the Carving Man. And he's sort of like this like hulking, slow moving monster. You can't hurt him. He's just like out to get you. And he's smashing through walls. There's some NPCs that you can kind of try to rescue as they're also running away from the Carving Man. And there's like a consequence if you fail to rescue them. He interacts with the environment that you're kind of manipulating in ways that you're like, you're trying to manipulate him so he doesn't he doesn't smash you anytime he gets close to you, he grabs you and throws you. We also are working on a thing where it's the whole level is like bones at the bone beach and you, you're just like going inside of monsters and stuff. So there's lots of ideas that we're working on and I'm like really excited to show it off and I'm, I can't, we're like, we're like almost there and I, and I just can't wait. <laughs> That's amazing. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you a little bit about Shovel Knight, one of the greatest games ever made. You did a lot of the pixel art for that. When creating the original Shovel Knight, how did you come up with all of the style? Did you have forced limitations to not go too far outside of what you could do? Yeah, absolutely. So we tried to adopt the limitations that aesthetically were pleasing and helped with that. You know, like you said, it could never run on NES because for one, it's widescreen. And that was like the first thing to think about. Like, no, we're not going to do a 4x3. That's crazy. You know, there's fright flickering. On the NES, that looks ugly and isn't really necessary. And so we kind of, we dropped it. But... One of the things I think that really helps solidify the NES style is the palette and using those colors. And so we grabbed that palette and we, we tweaked it a little bit. We added some colors for our own sake. For the most part, NES can't do dark very well. So we added a dark gray, a dark red, a dark purple. And the NES is also very highly saturated. So like 
it's really hard to just like blend colors together. So we had like a, a muted color that we added um, using, but using that palette and only limiting ourselves to five colors per character for the most part, there are a few exceptions. It feels like those games, like Mega Man, the NES could only do four colors per sprite, including transparency. And so Mega Man, you look at him, he's got the dark blue, the light blue, and he has yellow and he has skin. And what they're doing is they're putting two sprites on top of each other. And so you eventually get five. And so we took that as our, our base. So Shovel Knight has five colors because Mega Man has five colors, basically. It must be really cool also to get to see Nitro interpret your work in a Super Nintendo-esque style. Were you really like kind of like, how awesome was it to see this kind of evolved version of like what he started out to be? Unbelievably awesome. <laughs> Gustav Kilman is, he's one of the main artists on Nitro and I like have looked up to him forever. I used to work at Way Forward, and he, he was always making models for the game and and the sprite models were always like so cool. And I can just remember like going through the files for Batman, the Brave and the Bold, and just like looking at all of his sprite models. Cause there's a ton in there and they were always so good. And so like working with him was a personal dream of mine. Cause he's just like, you know, he's part of the old guard of pixel artists and he's like so good. His work is phenomenal. And like seeing what he did with the game. I mean, there's other artists there and I don't want to diminish them, but like Gustav Kilman's like, like one of my art heroes. So like having him work on the game was just very fulfilling for me. This may be a difficult question to answer because they're all your babies, I'm sure. But do you have a favorite night? Oh, yeah. I, I like Spectre Night a lot. Uh, Spectre Night was, I was working on that while I was at home when my daughter was being born. Spectre Night was also just like really fun to animate. It's really flowy clothing. I got to figure out exactly how his clothing is like put together. Even before he was the playable Spectre Night, which became way cooler, he was always my favorite. Just like his attitude and his poses and stuff. So, yeah, I like his, his attitude a lot. You know, who doesn't love an edgy hero, right? An anti-hero? Yeah, it's funny, like, Shovel Knight, I think, is my favorite character because he's the titular character. But after playing King of Cards, I really fell in love with that idiot. Like, he's just an idiot. Also, starting that game, I was like, I'm not getting into another card game. I can't do it. I know I don't have to play it, like, except for a few yeah. times. And then I ended up exclusively playing it for a ton of time. Yeah, King of Cards is really fun because we knew from the beginning that we wanted to be really cards focused. That was like our dream from the beginning. I mean, we kind of talked about it forever up until we started the production. And for a while, it was hard to find a balance of like, maybe we integrate the cards into the game. For a while, we had it so that he would throw like card juice. We didn't have a name for it, just card juice on an enemy and it would glow. And if you killed it, then you got that enemy's card. But that made everything like really meticulous and slow. And we didn't want that. And we also wanted to make it feel like different than Shovel Knight and different than Spectre. And Spectre had the advantage when you hit a wall, you would climb up it. And so falling in pits is kind of hard because it just, you just like walk up a wall, right? Sort of like how Mega Man X kind of adjusts that where you just like stick to walls all the time. And so with King Knight, we kind of wanted to adopt something like that. So like that's why he bashes into walls and he, and he gets shot up, right? So finding ways to like do fun gameplay but not have the card game interfere with it was kind of difficult. But the card game was like from the beginning something we wanted to do it's, and something that we wanted to like put a lot of effort into making simple and fun and like as addicting as Tetra Master, but not too crazy. So yeah, I think it was pretty fun. I think my favorite thing about the different episodes is that they are shades of games from my past while still being their own. While nothing is directly like, this is the same thing. It's very much a, oh, this will remind you of a thing. Yeah, and it started from understanding why that was fun and then like reinterpreting that, bringing new sensibilities. So like with the shovel drop, we, you know, we looked at Zelda too, and why that's fun is that it combines combat with mobility. It makes it so that the game's two core functions sort of like are unified. And, you know, NES games, maybe due to limitations, maybe due to intentionality, they kind of felt core, like surrounded by one mechanic. There was a core mechanic that kind of everything else kind of hung on. And so you look at old games like DuckTales and Zelda, that character is like really, you like really attached to it. And the same thing as we're approaching any of the games we're making. Mina, the Hollower, she's all about that burrow and all about like mobility, but mostly that burrow is the thing that's like really her thing. How we do everything is just like surrounding that mechanic and trying to figure out ways to make it and pull it out and make it fun. I'm gonna ask the question that you probably dread and hate every time. <laughs> okay. Mina's obviously under development. Things seem to be going great. Yeah. Obviously there's no release date yet. I'm optimistic of 2023, that's personally me, but do you guys have any idea of when you can narrow that down or is it just you're gonna keep going until you're ready to announce it? Yeah, we're, we're definitely focusing on, on the game itself and don't have a plan of release that 
includes us announcing anything. 23 and Fee would definitely be very, very optimistic. I'm not, I'm not seeing it, but we are seeing lots of progress lately, lots of really focused progress. We're like still like shaking off the last little scales of COVID. And I think now the, the studio is very like mixed as far as like in studio versus out. And so like adopting to that and like all the domino effects that's happening. But I don't want to blame COVID too much. We're just like, we're still working on it. By the time it's done, it's going to be great and have a whole world to give to you guys. Can't wait to play it on Switch eventually because that's my console of choice for these games. I have literally every game you've made on Switch. <laughs> my last question is, after the insanity that you let Celia get away with for the Shovel Knight Dig ad, will you let Celia write a Mina ad? Celia is the queen of memes, and there is no stopping her. <laughs> I couldn't stop her if I wanted to. She is constantly sending, hey, is this funny? And, I, and it's like a meme that I've never seen before. And I'm like, you made, you made a meme up. And she's like, no, no, it's a real thing. It's a format. It's a format. It's a meme. And I, and I just, all right, whatever. You know, and it's like the most ridiculous, I like, can't even understand it kind of thing. I'm not on TikTok or Instagram very much. And so it's just like, she has her finger on that weird pulse and she's great. I trust her implicitly. Amazing, Waz, thank you for your time. This is awesome. All right, folks, I'm chatting with Steve and PJ. Yes. Just wanna make sure I get it right. <laughs> Met a lot of people today. And we're talking about Wrestle Story, a brand new game that is just announced. I got to play the demo here at PAX. Tell folks a little bit about what Wrestle Story is. It's a turn-based RPG where you play a pro wrestler. You can create your own wrestler. You journey out into a wrestling-filled world. You recruit all kinds of other bombastic, crazy wrestlers with different move sets and personalities. And you might get into some hijinks. It's, it's a bit of a goofy game. That's kind of, we're goofy people. So we're excited to bring pro wrestling and RPGs together because we love Paper Mario and we love Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy, but we also love wrestling. And there weren't enough wrestling games out that allow you to experience a wrestling story. So I want to talk a little bit about the demo allows you to choose some presets, yep. but it looks like you can create a wrestler. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the presets you see, those are just pre-assembled characters made of the customization system that we plan to have in full in the game with the UI and everything. So you'll be able to pick like your hairstyle, your body type, your initial clothing, tattoos, makeup, basically your wrestling anything. Name, your wrestling name, like your backstory, like you're gonna, you're gonna be able to flavor your character like the way that you want them to be. Yeah, you can pick your victory animation too, so. As a non-binary person, I'm curious, is the look tied to gender or have you made it broader than that? Not at all, not at all. The look is the look and that's it. And that, that was a conscious choice by us. We actively, on our team, we have non-binary folks. We have people that identify all different types of ways. We have people with disabilities. So it was really important for us to try to be inclusionary as much as we possibly could because wrestling is not just for one type of person. Nothing should be, and in our case, with our game, it's explicitly for everyone. I love that. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of this. It's a turn-based RPG. There are talent systems, gear, all of that stuff. What was it like to design within the theme of wrestling? Yeah, I think when, when we were initially talking about a wrestling RPG, in a weird way, it just started to fall super quickly into place, right? Because you have your wrestlers who are powerhouses but they're slow. They might be weak to a more technical wrestler. So in our game, we have technical moves and big guys are weak to technical moves, right? So we really just followed the archetypes of wrestling as closely as we could and kind of just broke them down. I'm like, yeah, clothing is so important in wrestling. Like gear is so important. I remember one time when Batista came out and he was wearing blue. Everyone was like, he's wearing blue today. Wow, that's amazing. His name is Blue Tista now and it's gonna be a meme. And that for us, we're like, we know that costumes and outfits are important in wrestling. So we just wanted to adapt all of that stuff as like granularly as we possibly could. It seems like you're having fun with the themes. It's clear that the writing is comedy forward. Talk a little bit about what that process was like in putting a book together for something like this that has a lot of dialogue yeah. and a lot of story. It was definitely challenging because we've never created something that is as broad as this game is, right? Our game is about 20 to 25 hours long, and it's got hundreds of characters. And it was really important that we were character first. So we spent a long time developing our characters before we even started making the game. We wanted to make sure that these characters had motivations and they were real people, and that they had real personalities, and that the outfits weren't just a facade, right? That they were, that they were a little bit deeper than that, but that they were also truly rooted in wrestling. So. I think we spent a lot of time, but then we also just were like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if there was a frat king that 
drank a bunch of beer. Like, who has the most punchable face? This party king, right? This He's like an LMFAO guy who shows up at a frat party and is just loud and annoying. We're like, that seems pretty heelish. Let's put him as the first boss, because why not start simple, you know? And then it just kind of evolved from there with the team throwing around ideas, being goofy. Like, we're just a goofy team, so it comes organically. I love the announcers that you have. There's a heel announcer and a face announcer. I love that. Got to, like, JR, Jerry Lawler kind of vibe to it. Was that also a conscious choice to, instead of having, like, a narrator or some kind of storyteller to have the announcers kind of be the guide for the story? Yeah, I mean, in wrestling, announcers are the narrator. Announcers flavor everything. They give you perspective on characters you never would have had perspective on, maybe. And in our game, it's the same. They pop up. They give you context for what's going on. But they also have their own personalities, like you mentioned. And they, they go back and forth. They have their own storyline together. And they're going to be kind of battling it out throughout the story. And there may be some twists and turns even with them. Lastly, I want to know personally, because I want to play it as soon as possible. Obviously, you just announced it. Is there a projected time frame for when this is releasing? Platforms, any of that kind of stuff? We can tell you it'll be on Steam. And we encourage you to go wishlist it. We don't have a set release date yet, but we're going to keep on working on it until we're happy and we think that everyone else will be happy with it. So. We're currently self-funded, so we're working on it because we love the idea and because we love wrestling and we love RPGs. We're looking for a publisher, obviously, right now, but because of that, we're kind of taking our time. And that it's good in a way because we want to make the best thing we can possibly make. Of course. And so it's definitely on Steam, obviously. To me, I play an RPG. I think of the Switch. Like I feel like this would be a perfect Switch game. Let's just say that anything that's handheld and really easily accessible we want it to be there for sure well thank you both so much for taking the time i'm talking with seneca about shumi come home seneca thank you for talking with me thank you for coming by so i first saw shumi in one of the indie directs that like is showing off newer games and it immediately caught my attention because of the animation style and this kind of like cartoony aesthetic tell listeners a little bit about what shumi come home is about Shumi Come Home is about Shumi, our squishy little mushroom, who lost his way and ended up in a forest and is trying to find his way back home to his family, meeting quirky forest inhabitants who may or may not be helpful on his way back home. <laughs> so immediately the aesthetic strikes me as like very cartoony and cute. Shumi is just such a unique and fun design. Where did you draw inspiration for building this world? So just to make clear, I, I didn't um, well, sure. with the publisher, but I think, yeah, the inspiration was mostly or a lot to do with pandemic times yeah. and just needing something super wholesome and cozy and fun and nice for a change. <laughs> sure. It seems like the game is very focused on exploration. There's not really combat or fighting. It's mostly about like doing small tasks and interacting with these cute, quirky characters. I have to imagine a lot of the process was focusing on the writing and world building versus anything else because it's about filling a lived in place that feels real. Yeah, it's just about going around the next corner, meeting a completely new quirky character, getting to know their weird stories and just having fun exploring like a really cozy place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. With a game like this, obviously the intent is to just let people kind of take their time. I get the sense that you guys give direction and a little bit of nudge, but really you want people to explore and kind of learn on their own, just be curious and kind of interact. Yeah, I think that's a lot of the fun about it because it's not demanding much of you, but it's just the traversal is just really fun and um, it's fun to explore. From the publishing side, talk a little bit about the process to get this game out in the world. You're here at PAX. Do you have plans for release? Or are you still kind of figuring that out? What is the trajectory for the game? When can people play it? We do have a rough window, but no exact date just yet. It's going to be sometime later this spring. So not too far away, releasing for PC and Switch. It seems like the perfect Switch game, right? A cozy game you can play on a handheld. Do you have, I assume you've seen the demo and you've pl gotten to play it yourself. Do you have a favorite quirky character? Like, I like that there was a, I think it was a grasshopper that you meet early on that you get to find a pencil for, which is really cute. Do you have, like, a favorite character that you've seen so far? I actually love the one with the relics. 
<laughs> the one whose arms are too short to reach for the relics. I just, I just love that. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. Like the design feels very warm and inviting. It feels like I can see how something like this comes out of the pandemic because everything was just so stressful and kind of cut off. And this it genuinely feels like a community as Shumi's trying to find his way and interacting with different people those who are helpful, like it seems like this is a very much a game about community and uniting and fe not feeling so alone. Yeah, absolutely. And being able to go out, <laughs> meet people and family, finding your way back home. Amazing. Well, Seneca, thank you for chatting with me. I'm talking with the incredible Mike Toundro. Mike, how are you? I'm doing wonderful, Matt. Thank you for so much for having me. So we're chatting, you work for Vicarious PR. Yep. And I got to play Tape to Tape, which is your new hockey roguelike. Yes, you heard me correctly. It's a hockey roguelike. We were actually here promoting a few different games. But let's start with Tape to Tape. I'm sure you've spoken with the developers quite a bit. Like this idea to do a roguelike hockey game, where does that come from besides the fact that they're Canadian? Being Canadian, that's a big thing. They are very obsessed with hockey. Sure. But um, it's kind of twofold. Like they are big fans of the roguelike genre. They love what Hades is. They love what Rogue Legacy has done for the genre, kind of like the rebirth of the genre, you could say. And um, they wanted to do something different in the space and bringing hockey into it. We haven't had an arcade hockey game in, what, 10, 15 years? Yeah. And yeah, there's a, a an audience for it and there's a space that needs to be filled. Like EA right now has a stranglehold on all the hockey stuff. And it's too hardcore of an experience for most people. I, I think like, Personally, I'm not a hockey fan. Like I'm, I'm not watching NHL games whenever they air on, on TV. But like back in the day, I used to love playing NHL hits. I used to love playing NHL 94. And yeah, it's just a niche that needs to come back. And yeah, Tape to Tape is a fantastic hockey simcade experience, but it does a little bit of the Hades. So like the combat is you're playing hockey matches. And after you, of course, win every single match, you can select new superstars to join your team, and you could get new power-ups for your superstars. There's branching paths. Of course, like most roguelikes, each map ends with an epic boss battle. With tape to tape, sometimes they'll fight the referees themselves because they are corrupt. And yeah, it's just a fantastic time. It's such like an interesting blend that you haven't really seen before. Yeah, I mean, I'm someone who doesn't watch a ton of sports lately, but I used to love playing arcade sports game. I think of NFL Blitz and NHL Hits. But also there's something about having a, a sports game with not real players and not real people, right? Like, I feel like you're limited when you're doing your NFL, your Madden, whatever. You're using the players based on stats and actual people. Whereas here, your imagination can run wild. And also, it seems like comedy is kind of important to this team because, like, you have the Blade Masters, this giant goalie with a giant full face mask, looks like Jason Voorhees, just incredible characters. And like, even the matches, it's very kind of slapsticky the way you fight it out. It seems like there is a core of comedy here that really fuels this game. Yeah, I think it's really important. Like the game doesn't take itself too seriously. Like, it, obviously like it's a serious game in terms of like roguelite and stuff. Like you can get really deep with like your builds and your systems and whatnot. But in terms of the matches and just the tone, it's very bright vibrant comedic i mean you in the middle of the match if you want to throw your stick at a referee you can <laughs> and they won't see it and you'll be able to score a goal and you can win a match just by that and like similar to what i was just saying like literally like spoilers but like you will play a match against a team of referees you know it really plays into like the corrupt nature of referees and you have to kind of overcome that as a team and um developers excellent rectangle they love their memes they don't take the writing too seriously or anything like that just a good time it's a good vibrant time yeah it seems like a lot of fun but I really like that this game doesn't take itself seriously, but it still has like that hardcore roguelike feel. Yeah. Like the minute you see the open map, it's like if you played Slay the Spire, if you've played Hades, if you played anything, you're like, oh, I see a path. I know how this is going to work. Yeah, I think the important thing is that it's primarily a roguelike game. It's roguelike first, the hockey comes in. And yeah, you could just get lost in it, just with all the abilities, all the different branching paths, the power-ups, obviously like things with the Blade Master where you are crafting new quote-unquote weapons, which are just like hockey sticks and whatnot. You could really craft some interesting builds. So does this game have a release date or idea of when we might be able to play this or what we can play it on? We'll play it soon. <laughs> I mean, this is the first time I could drop like the PR soon on a podcast. It's coming very soon, I will say. And you'll be able to play it on Steam Early Access very soon uh, and then eventually the devs do want to bring it to consoles i know they're very passionate about switch and um i do think this will be a brilliant game for the switch 
yeah, pretty much anything where I can play a couple of matches or rounds or fights and then turn it up. I liked Hades on the computer. I loved it on the Switch. I became obsessed with it on the Switch. So I totally get like roguelikes to me are like hand in hand with handheld consoles. Yeah, I completely agree. That pick up and play nature of just like, okay, I got like 20 minutes to kill. Let me try a run. Well, thank you for showing me this game. This is really great. Before we wrap up, I would love for you to just talk a little bit about some of the other games that Vicarious is repping, maybe where folks can find them if they want to wish list them, that kind of fun stuff. Okay, so we got 20 Minutes Till Dawn. If you like Vampire Survivors, you will love 20 Minutes Till Dawn. Think of the Vampire Survivors formula, but it's a survivor's like with Cthulian Lovecraftian creatures. Battle system wise, like similar to Vampire Survivors where um, you don't really have any control of where you could fire. 20 Minutes Till Dawn, it's more of a twin stick shooter and you have full control of your combat, which is fantastic. That I'm personally a big fan of that. Toy Minutes Till Dawn ruined Vampire Survivors for me. <laughs> we got Black Skylands, Tiny Build's new joint. It's currently out on early access on Steam, but it's coming to consoles over the summer when it hits 1.0. Think a more approachable Hotline Miami with kind of like airship battles. So like you are off the airships, uh, just like roaming around a top down perspective, like shooting fools down and then you hop on uh, your airships it, you can completely customize your airships and like your your different weapons and different abilities and whatnot and just go on these like really epic air tirades it's really cool we got sanctuary saga which is actually a vicarious published title it is just an ode to classic jrpgs take your party out on a grand adventure turn-based battles have a good time it's out now on steam so please go check that out. We got Squad 51 versus the Flying Saucers. If you like shmups, you would love this game. Twin sticky kind of combat. But the real kicker is that it's aesthetically inspired by 1950s cinema. So it's completely like live action film where you are shooting down UFOs and stuff. And it's just gorgeous. It's something that's really wild to see an indie studio do. It's something you have to play. It's been on PC for a bit. It just came to the Switch. Runs wonderfully on the Switch. And then Super Space Club from Gram of Legend. Think Asteroids meets Star Fox, but with the sickest lo-fi beats you could think of. You choose between like these really cute animal characters, your ship, your loadout, your special abilities, and it's just an endless gunner. Just go out in space, listen to these incredible global tracks, and see how long you can last. It's just a wave-based shooter in space, and I cannot recommend it enough. It is coming soon again the developer just had a new baby so the oh, game man. got delayed a little bit behind the scenes <laughs> but yeah support graham's baby and wishlist super space club on steam <laughs> amazing well thank you for taking the time today to chat with me mike i'm chatting with junkie about coffee talk part two hibiscus and butterfly i'm very excited thank you junkie for taking the time to chat no problem at all thank you for having me so you're the narrative designer on coffee talk two the first game was a huge success. People really love it. What makes Coffee Talk Part 2 a little different? So we try to add more like about the world a little bit because it is still like an alternate Seattle. But since we know we, we have a lot of magical creatures and we all want to talk about certain issues, we push more about the involvement of the characters into the world a little bit. And the roots, there are like a several branching that's a bit more complicated. I think the story actually like doubled the size of the previous one, it's still 14 days, it's the same. It's just that it's a bit longer depending on what you choose to go through on the get your gameplay. What I love, of course, about the first game and a lot of people do is the story. Talk about tackling a brand new story with the same barista and what it was like to bring some characters back, let some characters go. Like, just was that a challenge that was really hard to overcome to get this game going? Oh, definitely, because back then I was hired as an outsource to write for this game. First, I was a comic writer and artist. I wasn't a game designer at all or a narrative designer. So this is actually my first game. And second, I knew how much Coffee Talk, the first one is actually very beloved. And it was really nerve wracking for me to continue it. And so I had to replay it like maybe close to like 15 times to kind of get the feeling, you know, what makes it tick, why people like it. But at the same time, when it comes to sequel, you know the risk. So. I tried to keep what Coffee Talk was about. And I think adding characters or having characters coming back, it's fine because the setting supports it. You know, you are a barista in a coffee shop and the regulars, sometimes they come or go and you listen to them like, hey, what's going on? And it's been a while since I saw you, you know? So it's not that difficult to sort of develop further. 
It's just that you need to understand how much a portion that the character actually develops. The first coffee talk, some characters already like have a, an art. And the second one, what do you want to know about the updates of their life? It's something like that. And for the second one, I guess the challenge is really, well, since I'm a first time narrative designer for game, I really don't want to disappoint the fans and also the late Fahmi. I mean, there's a legacy to this game. People really love it. What I'm curious about is there are new features too. Your social media app has a little more. You can give items with your order. It's displayed differently. Was that always part of the conversation? And the develop of the second game is kind of make it a little bigger, a little better without changing the aesthetics too much? Yeah, because it's about having the world a bit more immersive. So having to check the social media sometimes, you don't have to check it if you don't want to, but it's there if you want to. So it's like we're trying to give the sense that you are there, you know, to follow these characters life and then maybe get a little bit more insight on several ways. Like it's not just the social media, but there will be like other things as well. Was it harder to continue the voice of the existing characters or to kind of find the voice of these new characters that kind of just didn't exist before? I think both were kind of difficult because even the, these characters, the new ones, were actually originally like one person. Yeah. So uh, I used to be like a human influencer called Priya. And then when we did a test script, it was like rejected. It was so boring. So we decided to separate the character into two characters, which is like this uh, Banshee and the Satyr. And then, because by the end of the day, it is a game and we want to feel some type of reaction to this character, whether it's annoying or whether it's mysterious, you know. So new characters, we needed like that click kind of like, okay, uh, he's like at least a certain reaction to some people, you know, and that's better than boring. And for the older character, it was difficult because I think because the previous writer didn't have a Bible, like, uh, you know, kind of like a rule set. Right. So I kind of have to replay all the games over and over again to kind of get the feeling of, okay, so this character talks this way, this character feels this way, and I have to constantly go back and forth with Toge to kind of, uh, okay, is this character is right? It's not only me who write this second game, it's also there's sure. a co-writer. Uh -huh. So some of the older characters actually continued by my co-writer, Anna Winterstein. It's awesome. This is a beloved, cozy kind of handheld game. I assume with this game as well, that's the idea is to Steam, Switch, all the places that it was last time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it will be like in most consoles, Switch and Steam. Obviously, the, the first one will be Steam and then it will be continued with a Nintendo Switch uh -huh. and PS, Xbox, yeah, oh, everything. I think you will see the, the information on our social media. And so there's no hard date yet. You guys are working hard on it to make sure that we can play it as soon as possible. Oh. Actually, on 420 this year. So, Amazing. Yeah, it's like April 20. Yeah. Is there something that you're most excited about people getting to see? Well, first we have double the size of the story. Not the days, but the story. So you can learn about the characters in different ways. And personally, I'm more kind of like half excited and half scared. <laughs> because honestly, like the last thing I want to do is actually to disappoint the fans. So we'll see if it works or not. <laughs> I'm confident that people are going to love it. I love the first one so much, and I'm so excited that we're getting more of it. Yeah. It's a shame that the original creator is no longer with yeah, us, and yeah, it's a yeah, bummer. Yeah, yeah. But like to see that their legacy gets to live on a little bit in this game, and we get a little more is really, I think, bittersweet, but really nice. Definitely. Like, honestly, uh, when, if I can talk a bit about Fahmi, when we found out about him, because we talked with him like maybe around like 11 p.m. and he was gone by 1 a.m. and it was a shock. Like we, our, our development stopped like for a week. We couldn't believe. And personally, as the sequel writer, I knew him. I'm, I'm not too close, but I mean, we were in the same creative field and we met sometimes. I felt so, it's hard to explain, but I really wanted him to play this game because that's how much I respect his work, you know. But. I kind of rewrote some of the game, even though it was a kind of light, late stage, to sort of give some respect for him. So I really hope people will still remember him for now and for the future, because Coffee Talk will never exist without him. Thank you for that. That's really sweet. I'm really excited to get my hands on this game later this year. Thank you for being so generous with your time. And I'm here with Ian Moreno of The Behemoth. We're here to talk about Alien Hominid Invasion. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Thank you for stopping by. To start, let's talk about the legacy of Behemoth. I mean, you guys have been around longer than most other indie studios. You were doing it before there was a word for it. And now you're here back with a classic. 
What was the thought behind going back to Alien Hominid, one of your first titles, and now bringing this new twist on it? Yeah, well, a few years ago, original Alien HD was starting to disappear. You could only find it on 360 and back compat. So when we started to kind of look at that and try and figure out a solution, Dan Paladin started bringing up the question of, what would the game be like today? And what happened was that just triggered down us going down a path of rebuilding every feature from the ground up and just modernizing the game as a whole into a cooperative run and gun. It's very interesting because it's got like contra elements, but it seems the focus is missions and goals for the aliens instead of just recklessly killing everything. <laughs> yeah, well, one part of it is that the original game was that arcade style side scroller and there's a linearity to it. So we wanted to bring a non-linear experience. So you have an Intel phase where you collect Intel for Mama, or that's Mothership. She's a new character we've introduced into the, into the world. And then she sends you on these Mothership objectives and you do them on her behalf. But you could go at your own pace whenever you want to start. Something the Behemoth has always been known for besides great co-op stuff is cosmetic nonsense. And I say that with love. Is there a rough number of how many customizations are in this? Oh gosh. The rough, the rough number, there are just tons. tons. There are tons. I don't want to go into like the hard numbers because we're still adding more. But uh, again, I got to mention Dan Palin, the kind of creative force behind this, art director. This is all his art style. He's always just turning out new heads, usually ones that make you laugh. And with this game, they all have different stats associated with as well, which is a little different from our past titles. Do you have a projection for this? Do you kind of know when this is going to come out? What's the like plan process for the final touches on this game? I love this part because I get to say we're coming out this year in 2023. That's amazing. Very exciting. And do you guys know what platforms yet? Yeah, we'll be launching initially on Windows, so on Steam, Nintendo Switch, and Xbox One Series X and S. Amazing. So is this going to have both local and online co-op? Absolutely. We got local, online co-op up to four players. And you could do that. You could do the Switch thing, pull out all your Joy-Cons, et cetera. I should just quickly mention with the four players is that we have this cool feature where you could stack on top of each other's heads and you know the one on the bottom runs around and then you can all jump on another agent. It's great. That's awesome. Back in the Newgrounds days, you were limited palettes, right? You could only have so many frames, so many sounds. It must be like so much more rewarding to work on a game like this when you can do so much more on a modern console. Yeah, it, as we've been evolving with just our audio in general over the years with every game. So this one, compared to the last, those Intel and objective phases I talked to, we now have more adaptive audio where the music intensifies and rises and falls with what you're doing. So with run and gun shooters, especially four player ones, sometimes they tend to be stacked against the single player. Talk a little bit about how you guys have balanced that between one and four players and the different ways that people can make the experience harder or easier. Ooh. Yeah, so you could tailor your experience however you want, as well as when you're doing it, you're playing with up to three other players. As mentioned, we have easy, or excuse me, friendly, normal, and insane. We always have an insane mode. But when you play with four players, everyone can put set their own difficulty. In addition to that, we have two modes where you can play, we call it permakeep and mastery. Permakeep, you die, you keep all your items and all your loot and stuff. In mastery, it's a bit more punishing. You lose everything, minus your progression and access to those weapons, but you lose all your items. With those two different kind of things in mind, you and three other people uh, can have all various different settings, set your experiences, but still play together. And the game will account for that um, under the hood. That's amazing. It seems like that kind of accessibility for your games has always been important, and this is just continuing that ethos in the new game. Yeah, and also the original was a one-hit kill. We have a health bar now. <laughs> because Alien HD is notorious for being an extremely hard game. So we needed to deal that way in an elegant way. And I think we did it. The last thing I want to ask is, is there any possibility of returning to possibly other games? Things have become more and more on every platform, right? Castle Crashes is now on everything. But is there any vision of like returning to other IPs or possibly making sequels to other games that came before? I mean, as always, I gotta say, nothing to announce at this time. We're, like, we're solely focused on, on finishing this game. Once we're done, we'll see what's next. We have other little like side project things that we think people will be excited about. But the main thing is finishing this game and then prototyping and thinking about the next game. That makes sense. Thank you for being so generous with your time. I'm still here at PAX East and I'm chatting with Gabriel and Nicholas of Wild Arts. Thank you for chatting with me. Thanks. You're welcome. So I got to play Born of Bread a few days ago and there's Paper Mario influence, right? We can't deny it. 
what inspired this story and to create a game like this? Well, uh, after our first project, we knew we wanted to make an RPG. So we started playing a bunch of different games, and one of the games that really inspired us was Paper Mario. He grew up with it and he introduced it to me while we were researching, and we really liked it, and we thought it was a great foundation to build up on and uh, put our own spin on some of the mechanics. Story-wise, it started with a drawing of Loaf and the main villain, and from then we developed the world and figured out a story ar around them. I want to talk a little bit about that world. It starts with a baker creating a son out of bread. How did you find this story? Where did you draw this inspiration from? That's a good question, actually. But I think the story is just something that we thought once we created the character. We said, oh, this man must be made of bread or something. Like, he's a, he's a flower golem. And then the story just kind of organically fell from... And uh, I think there's also a little bit of inspiration from Super Paper Mario with the cast of villains. You'll see them often throughout the story, and uh, I think players will be surprised that some of the emotional depths in which we did delve. Yeah. Just from the demo, it seems like super surface level, but we really took time to put something more into the story and the characters. Well, I want to talk about the story because the writing is wonderful. Like, it's got this charm that you can't even explain. Talk a little bit about the writing process and how you made these characters come to life. Well, I started with an outline for a story, like a story beats I wanted to get to. Then we had the chance to work with two super talented writers, Faye Sims and Tom Kelly. They wrote all the dialogues for the game and uh, brought their own ideas into the mix. And uh, we couldn't be like prouder of what they, they have achieved. It's, there's some super eye-rolling puns, as well as fun jokes, even some poignant dialogues. The world is really beautiful. It feels very original, but definitely reminds me of other fantasies I've seen, but it has its own vibe as well. Yep, Gabriel is responsible for everything that's the art, but uh, I think like one of the biggest things that we strive for is having something that's really unique with the aesthetics and the theming of the game is a lot, like you said, it's a bit more serious. It's about the bonds you make with family and friends and how that shapes someone. In this case, it shapes them physically as well. <laughs> yeah, and the art style, I really wanted to make something that felt 2D but brought into 3D. Spent a lot of time figuring out how that would convey to the screen and also make it like super approachable. That's why it, it's kind of, it's cute. And, uh, and I think inspiration wise, there's a lot of my style as well as like shows like Adventure Time and Gravity Falls thrown into the mix. I see those are the two of my biggest starting points. No RPG is great without music. It has this oomph to it. It gives you the sense of adventure. Talk a little bit about how you created the music for such a big, bombastic RPG like this. We were super, super lucky to work with our composer, Rob. He composed all the tracks, and there's a ton of them. He worked super hard. We knew we wanted to have an aesthetic that reminded of Super Mario, but he also managed to twist it into its own thing. It's going to be one of the biggest things people notice about the game. It's the amazing soundtrack. Yeah, the staff keeps singing the songs and all, all the time. I mean, yeah, it's we're, crazy. We're looking at people play and we hear the music in our head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the combat because it could have just been timed hits and you were done, right? Like tons of games do that, but you don't do that. You have different mechanics, also different types of attacks. And like, it's not just MP, it's not just HP. Like you try and made it dynamic. Did you want to kind of from the beginning, give it this original feel. The biggest thing about the combat is we tried to make it really different, but familiar at the same time. Since we started from Paper Mario, and uh, we just tried to evolve the mechanics. So the perfect example of that is the crowd system from Paper Mario 2. We have in our game, but it's not a crowd. It's not a physical crowd. It's more modern. It's a Twitch stream. Someone like streams your fights, and you see their reactions. And sometimes they can be pretty rude and sometimes they can be pretty supportive, depending on what you show them. We've got a bunch of different ways to help you out in combat. So that Twitch stream can give you will points, which is our equivalent of uh, FPs. Yeah. There's also like items you can fill up on. There's a whole mode dedicated to gaining the WPs by defending. Yeah. That's also a big thing. Usually in RPGs, the defend option is not really something that you use, at least I don't. And we tried to add an actual use to it. So every time you defend, it's like a gamble where you'd say, OK, I think I can master this enemy's timing. And if you successfully defend, you'll gain extra will points. 
So it's like a way of rewarding mastery of the actual enemies you fight against. Do you have accessibility options for perhaps people who maybe aren't good with timed hits or find this game difficult? Yeah, some of the uh, button prompts we have received feedback from people who needed better accessibility. And we really wanted to introduce some options, especially like the ones where you have to flick the, the joystick really fast and stuff like that. I mean, these things we absolutely consider and we'll try our best to integrate in the yeah. final product. We also like introduced boons, which are our version of badges to uh, help out on some aspects also of combat for people who are, don't have necessarily a disability, but want a lesser challenge or want to play the game a bit differently. We are also looking at like, for a casual playthrough, you're looking at about 10 hours, like a quick one. And uh, for people who take their time, do quests, uh, explore a bit more, you're looking at 20 plus hours. Obviously it's gonna start on Steam, but do you have a plan for console releases? We're not supposed to talk about uh, anything like that, but I can assure you that we are considering it and it's definitely something that we care about deeply. Yeah, we can say we're working on console ports, but for now we can only say PC this summer. There are already so many quirky characters in the opening couple of hours. Do each of you have a favorite character or a favorite moment? Oh, that's Which is, I know, picking your children, but... Oh, God. Do you have one? Yeah, I think my, my favorite one is probably Papa Baker. Because, yeah. he, I mean, he's such a great dad. You meet him and he's so genuine and he's just a, a great dad. I feel we have really great dads. I think that's Aww. a big part of, uh, of yeah. that. For me, it's so hard to say. I drew so many characters. Yeah. I thought about so much of their motivations. It's really hard for me to say. There's so many characters. There's a lot of NPC you can talk to. And I'm actually super eager to see which ones stick with people and which ones don't. Yeah. yeah, you never know with an RPG which characters people will stick on. So excited to see how the story grows. So say again, where folks can find the game and when they can expect to play it. Well, they can wish us, uh, wish list it on Steam, uh, or they can find us on Twitter at uh, Wild Arts Devs, or they can also follow the Dear Villagers Twitter page and socials. Amazing. The last thing I'll ask you to do is we have a saying on the podcast. It's Happy Gaming. I'll count to three, and then both of you can say it at the same time. Yeah. One, two, three. Happy, Happy Gaming. gaming. Hi, I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon, and I'm the host of CPOV Autographs at CertainPOV.com. It is a bi-weekly interview series where I interview folks from all over the arts, from writers to comedians to magicians to musicians, even actors, historians, podcasters, pretty much anyone who's willing to chat with me for a little bit. If you like interesting conversations with even more interesting people, go to CertainPOV.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, music is life and life is good. CPOV CertainPOV.com